greetings, peace uh, to all the true gods and goddesses on the path uh, that are doing the work. I want to welcome everybody to the show. Uh, I'm going to keep it to about an hour and a half tonight. I uh, got something to do. Uh, as I said, for the last several weeks, I'm in the midst of doing some uh, personal work. So I'm trying to keep uh, the time frame tight. So I try to go to about 930 ish. So I'm kind of going to uh, go through the material. But before I do that real quick, um, upcoming events, obviously this Saturday uh, already, uh, the online classes begin in four days uh, for those that signed up. Uh, just again, want to make sure everybody that signed up for the class uh, should have received the material list last week. Um, I didn't get any emails from anybody that didn't. Uh, so if by chance you did not get the email, um, please send me an email, uh, the link, excuse me, for that uh, class. For those that signed up, you should be receiving that in a few days. All right. There. Excuse me. Um, I uh, posted on the Instagram. I posted it uh, on the Facebook. Still a couple days left. If you decide that you want to sign up, still have a few days left to sign up for that. Uh, I like to have everybody signed up up until the day before. Um, I don't mind doing it uh, as far as time-wise late. Um, that's the latest. Uh, to do it the same day becomes a little confusing. Um, so I put that post out there. Uh, I know people are now aware of the ritual that we will be getting back in the, into the swing of things uh, the end of next month. Uh, the ritual the fly went out. I'll put it out a few more times over the next several weeks. Um, so that, that is planned for Friday night, August 30th, <clears throat> excuse me, 8 p.m. Um, here in uh, North Fort Lauderdale. Back that up right here. Um, if you would like to attend that ritual, you do need to send me an email to request an invite uh, just so we could have a brief conversation and make sure we're on the same page as far as the ritual work is concerned. Uh, let me also put out there the uh, event that we're having in October. Uh, I already have two people that have contacted me to present and uh, in addition to what we have planned. So there is still some spots on the itinerary if you're gonna come to the event, which is October 25th to the 27th. You would like information on how to register for that three-day event, uh, location, things of that nature. Again, shoot me an email and I'll get you that information and believe it or not, it's already July, middle of July. It just seems like when we first started talking about this, that October was so far away, but it's, it's not, it's right around the corner. Uh, again, uh, I, I saw some emails before I get on. Uh, I know a couple people had sent me an email about consultations. I will respond to that. Uh, I know somebody else emailed me about adding themselves to the meetup that we are having in New York City. Let me, let me put that out there as a reminder. I did get back to everybody that emailed me after last week's shows. Uh, so that gathering is growing a little, little bigger than I thought it would be. It's probably gonna continue to grow. Um, we will be meeting uh, for those in the New York City area that wanna meet up. Um, I will be there on, uh, we plan the meetup for Saturday, August 17th in the very early evening hours. Uh, we're gonna meet up uh, at Penn Station right there on 34th and 7th Avenue, and then more than likely walk up to 6th Avenue, get something to eat. Park which is a huge park, has a lot of stuff going on over there throughout the day and the week. Uh, we're kind of gonna have like a meet and greet and a little build slash class session. So kind of like a free fall if there's uh, any questions uh, you would like to ask, topics you would like to build on, that's pretty much what we're gonna do that night. Uh, so for those in the New York City area uh, that are interested in coming to that, that's gonna be on Saturday, August 17th, shoot me an email so I have, I have everybody on the list and we'll coordinate, uh, you know, the meetup time to make sure everybody's accounted for. Um, I have confirmed already, I believe it's eight or nine people, uh, three pending. So I, I'm, I'm expecting right now 10 to 15 people that might grow, um, but we'll see how that works. Uh, but again, you might stumble across this video, you still got time. Um, other people might see this in the New York City area, uh, more than welcome to come. All right, that's uh, gonna be on August 17th. I'll actually be in New York that whole week. Uh, plan on attending a couple of Yankee games and spending some time at home, doing some things home, uh, as I uh, always look forward to do. 
uh, when I come home. All right, so that's going to be on August 17th. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, consultations and readings. I've now started to uh, put on the YouTube, on the Instagram page and the Facebook page, the type of readings that I offer. Uh, if you want to do a reading with the Orishi, uh, if you can do a reading with the Vodun or Voodoo deities, the Loa, uh, if you want to do a, a reading with the spirits of the dead, uh, Egyptian rune reading with the Natiru, uh, or Goetia, uh, or demonic reading with the Klepathic deities, specify that in your email. Um, I've now posted that and made that known. Uh, so you do have uh, the choice uh, to pick from those options. If you don't, uh, I will just go with my intuition as I've always been doing for years and just whatever my intuition tells me to use, I use. Uh, that's pretty much how that works. All right. That's pretty much it for the announcement. So what I wanted to talk about tonight, uh, as you see, uh, well, first, let me just peace and greetings to everybody. I know I didn't even look. Uh, peace, peace to uh, Scotty Nasparatu, uh, Brother Matthew Watson, uh, Alicia, peace and greetings and everybody else. Um, so what I want to kind of talk about, uh, the topic that I kind of want to get into. What's going on, man? Hold on. There we go. Okay. So I'll make sure I get all my settings right. Um, as you see the topic, light and darkness in uh, Luciferian Gnosis. Um, there's a misconception on light on the left-hand path. Uh, those that don't understand the concept and how it's applied, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, obviously, light means something entirely different to us on the left-hand path, regardless of what system you work, if it's Luciferianism, uh, if it's vampirism, any, any left-hand path system of spirituality. We're going to go over that. We're going to get a little bit into, uh, in some uh, systems, not talked about a lot, uh, Lucifer's uh, brother, as they say, very similar to the concept of when you talk about Papa Legba and and, and his so-called Kalfu, his twin brother, very similar concept. And I, I and I always, in my opinion, from my research, I felt that that's where that came from. That's just my my own opinion and my own research. Um, hold on one second. Something's not right here. It's just internet access working here. Yeah. Just give me one second. I'm going to check something. Bear with me one second. I'm just checking connections and things of that nature. Hold on. Okay. All right, I, I, I always thought that Kalfu uh, Legba concept was very similar to the story uh, of Lucifer and his brother Lucifer. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so I want to kind of understand, I, I kind of want to get into uh, that correlation between light and darkness. What, what is it really and what does it represent uh, on this path? Um, so I have a short excerpt uh, from um, the Rites of Lucifer. Uh, by Aseneth Mason. It's an excerpt that she has in there. Um, it's a really good book. I know a lot of people are familiar with it. That's the book there, The Rites of Lucifer. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Um, has a lot of good information in there, some good ritualistic work. A uh, very uh, simple book uh, to work with. Okay. Hold on one second. Something's not right here. Bear with me one second, people. Still got something not right here. I don't know what it is. Hold on. Just bear with me one second. I think I know what it is. I'm trying to check my... Hold on one second. All right, we'll get this. I think I got... Had this problem last week. Hold on one second. Just going to make sure this is gone. I think we're good now. Hold on. Still not right. All right. Hold on, see what it is. All right, there we go. 
Okay. Yeah, I had that a similar problem last time I came on. It just had two things. All right, anyway, looks like we got it going. Uh, so um, I'm going to go through that excerpt from the book I just showed you real quick, a uh, couple things. And we're kind of going to build on this light and darkness thing. Uh, and again, as I said, light means something entirely different to somebody on this path. Uh, it's not like light. Uh, that you see from a religious, uh, wicked, new age perspective. Remember, light to the Luciferian represents intellect. Lucifer is the divine representation of that light, right? So for the most part, in a nutshell, that's what light represents to us, all right? Okay, so I'm going to read something on that. We're going to start there. The question of light is often controversial among left-hand path magicians who would rather view themselves as adepts of darkness. Now, I've talked about this. Sometimes people on this path can be guilty of being, in my opinion, too dark or professing, I should say, to be too dark. Everything is dark this, dark that. I'm so dark, I'm so dark. Uh, that's not always a good thing because there's a disconnect in that. We're going to talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> The left sinister side is associated with all that is dark, antinomian, against the grain, forbidden or dangerous, and thus holding power and exciting. The concept of light connected, connected with that which is mundane, imposed, safe, familiar, socially accepted, etc., is viewed as boring and confining. And that's a misconception. That's why I, that's why I was saying don't, don't interpret that concept how it's presented on the surface, all right? It is the dark, sinister quality of the left-hand path magic that fascinates and attracts potential adepts to take the first steps on the path. Lucifer is seen as a dark initiator, spirit of pride and rebellion, a dark lord who presides over rites of black magic and exploration of forbidden desires, leading the initiate away from the world of mundane routine and obligations. It is all true, and indeed, he is all that, but the draconian Gnosis is much more complex. And while it rests on the principle of darkness, there is also a place for light and Lucifer as a perfect embodiment of this manifold tradition, embraces and unites both. And that's the one thing, and we talked a little bit about that last week with Hecate, right? The difference with Hecate and one of the key attributes of Lucifer, they combine, they bring that harmony between the light and the darkness, the intellect, and what we know the darkness represents, that, that unlimited, uh, no restrictions, no boundaries, uh, which encompasses all. We, we, we connect through it uh, using various aspects, uh, be it the clepotic tree, the concept of void and darkness. Uh, so Lucifer brings the harmony of that, what we call dark and light energy together, right? This is important to understand because Contrary to belief, some people say, and, 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 and usually it's people that have no knowledge of this path because they just think the spooked out, scared people uh, that are indoctrinated and, and let themselves be indoctrinated with fear from ignorant people. They think that all this path is about is gloom or doom, or they think everybody that's on this path wears black clothing and, and, and uh, you know, uh, 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 satanic symbols or, or they have this gothic concept, which is all a bunch of crap. Um, now, are there people that express themselves like that? Yes. And that's their, their business. Um, so I'm not knocking if that's the way you choose to, to dress and, and, and present yourself. But to the ignorant, that is not the sole representation of this path. There's a lot of people on this path. You would have no clue they're on this path. They just, they're just your everyday ordinary people that blend into society. They work jobs, run businesses, have careers. They're very productive uh, people. Um, so there's this illusion, just like everything else, that if one is on this path, there's this stereotype or image that somebody has in their mind of people that are on this path. Um, so we have to eliminate that, okay? That doesn't exist. That's a fairy tale illusion. Um, you'll be surprised when you move in higher circles you'll be surprised who's on this path and works this path. You wouldn't even have any clue. And your preconceptions of what that person 
should look like and how they should act uh, would be even more confusing. I've seen them from all walks of life on this path and all races. Uh, I've seen every ethnicity. I've seen from your very conservative laid back person to your more, uh, you know, free flowing spirit, expressive person. I've seen business people, doctors, lawyers, politicians, uh, prominent business people, etc. cetera, all right? So let's get the stereotype thing out. Uh, we don't walk around wearing hoods and black robes everywhere we go. You know, we, see, we save that for the chamber room. But unfortunately, this, this is some of the, and it's sad you even got to talk about it, but I got to keep it 100%. Unfortunately, there are ignorant people out there who have this misconception that that's what people on the left-hand path are. And I've always addressed that. I don't even really, as I've said many times over the past, I, I don't really like the term because uh, I like to use the path of self-mastery more because let's, let's keep it real. Left-hand path has been a, a term that has been stereotyped because the average person, the non-Black, uh, Latino, or Asian person is not really included in that term. Let's keep it 100%. Uh, left-hand path, the concept of that, of what it represents, but the, the left-hand path has been more affiliated with more uh, white or European people that practice uh, this path. And I'm, I'm only saying that not from a, uh, a racist perspective. I'm just saying uh, we need to focus. It's more about what left-hand path represents. Uh, it's against the norm. Uh, it, it represents being a non-conformist, the other side. It's just a symbolic term. And again, I'm saying all that to say we don't want to get caught up in titles and terms because titles and terms are what humans need to make themselves feel comfortable. I only use those titles and terms for the listening audience. So, you know, not so much for the experienced person on this path, but for somebody new that might stumble across the channel. Unfortunately, some individuals don't feel comfortable if they can't identify or put a label on something. That's just the reality. It's the society we live in. From a pure spiritual standpoint, I don't believe you can put a title on anything. Uh, that's just my opinion. Uh, this path to me really doesn't have a title. That's why I'll use the term self-mastery because it embodies and encompasses such a wide uh, range of information, knowledge, and spiritual practices. Uh, but you really can't put a title on it because it doesn't have any boundaries. It doesn't have any limitations. You see, for those that are real practitioners on this path, you see how vast it is. I did a video a while back called the 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 uh, versatility and vastness of this of the path of self mastery. Um, the beauty of it, as I've said many times before, you can utilize so many. If you if you want to work with the Hindu pantheon, you can. If you want to incorporate vampirism, if you want to work with the ancient Natira, the Orishi, the Budon deities, whatever you, there is no boundaries. There is no right or wrong. That's what separates this from everything else that's out there, because everything else that's out there, you, you have to be exclusive to it. You have to join the club. You have to get the stamp of approval. You have to be part of the clique. You have to be down with the group. And if you don't or you're an, you're, you're an adverse to what they're, what they're doing, then you're, you're labeled uh, an outcast or, or some type of devil or somebody. You know, it's. It's all bullshit, but that's that's part of creating that harmony between light and darkness. But let, let me continue. I know I kind of went off a uh, path for a second there. All right. All right. So it says, and while it rests on the principle of darkness, there is also a place for light. And Lucifer, as a perfect embodiment of this manifold tradition, embraces and unites both. All right, we left off there. His his nature is primal and limitless. He reflects the darkness of the void. And that's why we look at the adversary as the cheap representative of that concept, be it Lucifer, be it Satan, be it Samael, be it uh, Sotuk or Set. Uh, they're all different masks of the adversary because they represent what that does is the masks of the adversary represent the unique characteristics of what that represents. And when you are a black magician utilizing these concepts, that's why you say, well, what's the difference of working with Lucifer? What's the difference of working with Set? What's the difference of working with Samael? There is a difference. You have to understand what that mask or aspect represents, the type of energy that's connected to it, and how can you connect through it via your ritualistic work? So people, 
This is why people sometimes get confused. I get this question all the time. Are they different or are they same? They're different yet the same. I know that sounds contradictory, but it's very true. They're, 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 they're different, but very the same. Okay, they're, they come from the same source. They come from the same energy, but they're, they're just different aspects of it, okay? Okay, uh, the womb of the dragon at the same time shining bright with the light of illumination. He's the Lord of light and the spirit of darkness, the angel and the devil. Remember, I, I mentioned, I don't know, it might've been last week or the week before. Lucifer is referred to as an angel of light and, the, and he, one of his terms is the prince of darkness. There's that again. You have embodied in that title the, the, the bringing and the union together or the embodiment of the harmony of light and darkness. That's what's unique, okay? Hakate, which we were talking about last week, very similar in nature. Uh, they more or less utilize that concept through the, through the symbolic concept of the queen of heaven and earth, the trifold manifestation we talked about last week, and in between incorporating that earthly or mortal existence that connects those two realms uh, or abodes, all right? So we have to understand these concepts when working with these archetypes or deities, all right? He is the Lord of light and spirit of darkness, the angel and the devil. The duality is the key motif of many legends and stories that are found in a number of ancient myths, Gnostic and Christian tales, works of literature, and countless artistic interpretations. One of the older stories known to the world is the ancient Greek legend of the two brothers. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this. And that's what I was just, I was talking about earlier. Uh, Lucifuge, who, who, who we work with through the goetic aspect or working with the demonic realm. There's the Greek myth of this. As I said earlier, you will find this story represented in, in the concept of, uh, you will find this story represented in the concept of Papa Legba and Kaufu when, when working with the Vudon or, or, or dealing with the Loa, you will see that. Um, but let's, we're going to talk about a little bit about this. Um, so that the Greek aspect is the story of the two brothers, uh, Phosphorus, light bringer, the morning star, and Hesperus, the evening star. Personifying in the morning and the evening appearance of the planet Venus in the firmament. While Phosphorus or Esophorus represented Venus at dawn as half-brother, Hesperus or Vespera, meaning evening, west signified its light in the darkness of the night. Now notice in the Catholic Church, there's a prayer they do in the evening. They call it the Vespers, right? This, this is not a coincidence. Uh, if you're familiar with Catholicism, strict Catholics know what I'm talking about. The book of uh, uh, their, their regular prayer book. They conclude the evening. Uh, I'm talking about those strict Catholics, priests in monasteries, uh, close out their evening with the Vespers or the evening prayers. It's not a coincidence. And as I said before, I want to get into all the religious stuff now. Makes you question uh, who is this God of the Bible or this, this God of light, as they call him, and who are they really praying to? All right, I've said this before. I just did a show on that a couple of weeks ago. But it, it, when I saw that word Vespers here, when I first read this book, I said, wow, that's the term they use uh, in Catholicism uh, for their daily evening prayers, all right? So I found that interesting. And signified its light in the darkness of night. And at first they were even believed to be two different celestial objects, all right? <clears throat> Phosphorus, the god of dawn, was a son of the goddess Eos. He was depicted as a nude winged boy with a torch in front of his mother, or the sun god of Helios. The Roman translation of his name is Lucifer, and his depiction is one of the oldest associations of Lucifer with the torch-bearing god of light. The description of the two brothers is found in the god of light. The description of the two brothers is found in the Iliad, where Phosphorus emerges from the ocean to proclaim the arrival of the divine light, all right? In the morning, while Hesperus is presented as the most splendid star in the night sky. Now I'm gonna skip some of this and go down. That's just some of the basics. Now I kinda of wanna get into uh, more the aspect of Lucifer, bring it on up to 
uh, its its point of origin, which to me is a little bit more important. So there's that Greek origin. Now, even though they don't, they don't mention in here, to my knowledge, uh, the aspect, which I believe is very similar to this, again, of Papa Legba and Kao Fu, very similar. Um, but let me continue on down. All right. Um, the association of Lucifer with the morning star is also derived from Old Testament, where the original Hebrew term halal ben shahar is translated into Latin as Lucifer, from the Latin words lux and fairy to bring. In the Vulgate, the word Lucifer appears in many different contexts, often referring to the morning star, the planet Venus, the light of the morning star, which it refers to in the book of Job and Psalms, it was much later that the name Lucifer came to be used in the Christian tradition as a name for the adversary, the enemy of the faith and the prince of darkness. You won't even find the word Lucifer in the Old Testament or Hebrew. You don't see that till you get into the, the uh, book of Revelations and into the New Testament because being translated out of the Septuagint, the Greek and Latin, that's where you start to see that word, all right? <clears throat> The idea of Lucifer having a dark twin brother, now let's get into this, is, is a recurring motif in Western esotericism as well. Sometimes this is Samael, the black angel of death, depicted with six pairs of black wings. Samael is associated with the Syrian god Shemau, the shadow spirit of earth, darkness, and physical world. The Gnostics depicted him as the evil demurge who created the earth and imprisoned souls in flesh and matter. Presenting their ascent to salvation, he is the chief of evil spirits and a being of darkness and shadow. His domain is poison. Now, Samael means poison those of El. That's what you're saying in Hebrew when you're saying Samael. El is the definite article and represents the biblical God, right? All right. Uh, his domain is poison and his manifestation is black fire that sheds no light. Both he and Lucifer are archetypes of the devil. So they're, they're two different character or archetypes of the same thing. That's what I mean when I said earlier, is when people ask, are all these the same or different? They're different yet the same. See, you gotta get out of your mind that there's this physical being, there's a, there's a character, that's what religion does. That there's this one God, like, and I'm, I'm using the same concept it's like when you're reading the Egyptian history or the, there was many incarnations of Horus. There were many manifestations of Shango where people get caught up and they think there was only one specific. Anytime somebody was raised to a certain level of knowledge, they attained that title. They became a Shango or a Batalaz. Just like when you get crowned in Ifa, you have now become whatever Orisha you were crowned. In essence, you are that to an extent, I know some people ego trip with that shit, but where we can kind of get lost in history because when there's been different incarnations of these beings over a long period of history, we get confused. It appears to be contradictory. What is this talking about? I thought there was only one. No, there's many manifestations. They are all the same energy. They all represent the same source because in essence, let me say this. Things only take shape and void when you manifest them yourself. When you're dealing with the void and darkness and existence, things just exist. There is no physical shape or form that we can connect with like we do here on the physical realm. I know that might sound a little confusing, but it's given life shape and form so we can connect with it on that level. But we're the ones that give it life, shape and form. What do I mean when I say that? I want to be clear on this. If you start feeding yourself a bunch of information, let's say about a particular deity or archetype, whether you're conscious of it or not, you're starting to give it an image. You're starting to give it a likeness. You start to create what it looks like. And then when you start doing work with that particular archetype or energy, it takes on the shape and form that you gave it, that you created it. And that's why it's gonna appear and look as you see fit to appear. What do I mean when I say that? Just so there's no confusion. How many people have worked with, let's say, uh, Kali, right? People say they work with Kali, okay? And people say they had a vision or experienced uh, Kali, but yet Kali doesn't appear or look the same to all those people that had that vision. Why is that? Because each one of those individuals gave it that.
that life, that form, that likeness and, and how it looked based on what they fed themselves subconsciously. Because if it's, it's, I use the analogy too of why is it when you see in Catholicism, everybody has these, well, we know part of it's conspiracy, but why, why is it everybody seems to have this same description when they see a vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary, for an example, right? We, we hear about and see this all the time over years, over the many years. Why is it, there's a very, I mean, is it identical 100%? No, nah, I'm not saying it's always, a, but there's always a lot of similarities. Why is that? Well, a lot of these hardcore Catholics that are having these images, most of them have been programmed from a very early age through imagery. Why do you think the Vatican and the Catholic Church used images of, of men in their traditions and had artists draw them up to stamp those images in the minds of individuals, all right? <clears throat> and what's unique about that is, one thing I found, I, I remember asking, I was visiting a old church uh, a couple years back, and this was in Macon, Georgia, one of the oldest Catholic churches um, in uh, the United States of America, and I, and I believe it was constructed in 1899, if I'm not mistaken, St. Joseph's Church. Uh, they were given tours, uh, a very, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful building. So I wanted to actually check it out. Um, so I went in there and as the, as the uh, priest was given the tour of the church, he was given the history of the building. So I just figured a very indiscreet way I would ask a question. I said, well, how did they come up with the images of Jesus, uh, different pictures of the prophets and, 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 and the pictures on the stained glass windows? Here's the answer what this guy told me. He said, when they construct and build, build these churches, the artists would draw the images of Jesus, the apostles, and, and the other so-called holy figures of the Bible. They would put the faces of people they know to the pictures they drew. This was what the priest told me. And that's how that church came up with its imagery. The artist put uh, somebody in he knew's face to Jesus and the apostles and Mary and Joseph. And I found this interesting because Imagery is very impactful. When, when imagery is stamped in the subconscious mind, it leaves an effect unconsciously and consciously, okay? So when these Catholics are being spoon-fed a consistent image of what Virgin Mary looks like, when they have some type of epiphany or spiritual or subjective experience, what, what do you think more than likely majority of them are gonna see, okay? They're going to see that image you see in all the churches and in, in, all, in, all, their, in all their books and, and all their imagery. It's no different in any other culture. And that's how through imagery, right, through artists like Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel, they have been, been able to project that image all across the planet. Right. And that's that's what's synonymous with Catholicism slash Christianity, regardless um, that's just a reality. So it's no different if you're on this path, okay, and you're 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 um, studying and you've got imagery out of books. Let's say Lucifer, and if you're doing a meditation with Lucifer, you're gonna create some image that you've stored in your subconscious mind and manifest that, so you can connect with it. Where connect with it? Where from this realm, the physical to the spiritual, it's your connector. When you further that work and you keep evolving, you'll find it goes beyond that. Um, it's kind of tough to put it into regular words because it probably wouldn't make much sense. The experience is the answer to that question, but that's the connector, okay? But anyway, all right, I don't even know what the fuck I left off. Okay, right here. Sometimes they are identified with each other and are thought to be one and the same being. Other times they are viewed as brothers. Lucifer embodying the light of ascent. Samael personifying the darkness of the clip path. And that's why when you're working with the clip path, the tree, uh, they say Samael slash Lucifer. All right. Okay. Uh... Uh, in the draconian magic, they can be viewed as two aspects of the demon god of the night. Excuse me. Excuse me. Together with Lilith, the queen of the night, 
He rules the whole Klippatha tree. Samael Lucifer from his throne in Thamuel and Lilith, appearing at each level of the tree, acting as a guide and initiator on the path of the ascending flame. The image of the union and the encircling force is the serpent dragon Leviathan, the principle of continuity and ageless existence. What does Leviathan represent? The principle of continuity and ageless existence. Remember, Tiamat emerges out of Leviathan. Leviathan represents that abyss, that darkness. You find the term of Leviathan in the Bible, right? You see it in the Bible. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I got distracted by watching something. Anyway. Um, You, you, you see it all, we've talked about it, uh, you know, over the years on the show. You see it all throughout the Bible, um, and Leviathan represents, again, that abyss, that void, that darkness, right? The principle of continuity and existence. It's important to understand that. Tiamat, which represents the primordial chaos, emerges from that Leviathan energy that we talk about, okay? All right. Another dark half brother is of Lucifer is Lucifuge, right? Uh, I know not, not many people might be familiar or work with this. You don't hear a lot about it. Uh, Lucifuge, uh, Rofocal, right? Or Rofocali, some say. A spirit known from a number of Solomonic grimoires, the most famous of them being the Grand Grimoire. When you, when you talk about Solomon and working with the temples, uh, the Jen, etc. cetera, all right? He is often compared to Lucifer and thought to be the dark half of the light bearer. This concept is very similar to Kafu and Papa Legba, in my opinion, if you're familiar with uh, voodoo, right? Uh, one who flees from light or conceals light. His name is derived from the Latin word lux, light, and fugio, to flee. In terms of the left-hand path philosophy, this is interpreted as the escape from divine light into inner darkness. Okay, and there's a representation in that. The descent into the personal underworld to seek illumination within. So it doesn't represent anything evil. Uh, when, you're, when you talk about lucifuge, right, you're talking about going into that, voluntarily taking the initiative to go into that inner darkness, to go into that continuity of ageless existence, that Leviathan energy, where you will obviously emerge out of that or bathe yourself in that through pure primordial chaos. Hence, one of the motivating, motivating reasons I call this channel Primordial Chaos because of that principle. It's what inspired me to name or change the channel to this name. Because in essence, that's the core of what this doctrine re really represents in a nutshell. That's, that's the essence, the foundation, right? All right. Um, the only true light of Gnosis, Lucifuge Rofocal, is also the ruling demon god of Satyriel, who guides the adept through the pitch black labyrinths in the Cliffa, right? <clears throat> I'm sorry. I got, I got a couple of things going on here. I lost my spot. Uh, blah, 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 where the fuck did I go? Okay. Who guides the adder through the pitch black labyrinths of the cliff fire into the womb of the dark mother, the goddess of the night side. Now you could say that to Tiamat, you could say Hakate, very similar. Here under the cloak of the concealed, the all seeing eye is open. The concept corresponding to the draconian principle of clear seeing, Lucifuge becomes Lucifer. And the inner darkness is revealed as the light of illumination. All right. Yeah, definitely don't have time to get through all this. Uh, I'm going to skip now. In all these legends, Lucifer is paired with a dark counterpart, be it a half brother or a female counterpart or consort. He is the spirit of light, referred to as the shining one, bringer of dawn, day star, son of the morning, light bearer, etc. He is never a dark being. On the contrary, he embodies the concept of illumination, the light of Gnosis. Okay. 
So where do all these dark and sinner associations come from? That's a good question. That's why, again, I, I, I picked this piece and to talk about light and darkness because there's a misconcept amongst the ignorant. Again, I'm not talking about people that are on the path that are familiar with the concept of light and darkness and what that represents uh, to us on this path. Uh, so I'm also speaking to those that might not be aware and be on this path uh, to those that want to be so dark and gloom and doom all the time. And I've mentioned many times before over the last couple of years in videos, we're sometimes guilty on this path of trying, in my opinion, to be too dark. Everything is I'm dark this and I'm dark that and dark matter and dark, you know, dark, 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 dark. There could be overkill in that and a disconnect in that because really in, es in essence, we're all seeking illumination. But we have to go in the darkness to really obtain what true illumination is. And that illumination one gets in the darkness is the knowledge and true intellect of themselves. That's what the light represents. So the funny thing is we always talk, we, we always talk about dark magic, the left-hand path and darkness, prince of dark. But in essence, we're really striving to seek illumination on a multitude of levels. All right. That's the real deal. First of all, we have to be aware that the concept of light can be understood in many different ways. For followers of the right-hand path traditions, light is the domain of God, the superior being, the highest uh, spiritual enlightenment. The tree of life is the emanation of this divine force and is permeated with God's splendid brilliance that flows from above the whole tree. The divine light is known as Ayin Saf Aor, without saf and our light and is believed to be the origin of all creations mystic and adepts of these systems seek to ascend to the infinite brilliance and unite with it thus fulfilling the highest goal of the path it is a process of many ordeals and requires absolute devo devo devotion and faith in the absolute but the tree of life is imperfect and unbalanced contaminated by the forces of the clip -hop that continuously seek to destroy the cosmic balance. In many Kabbalistic theories, okay, <clears throat> the tree of death was not part of the original picture at all. There was no material level of Malkuth either. The tree of life consisted of the 10 Sephirah with Dath as the central and balancing forth behind the whole cosmic harmony. In the original tree, Dath was the upper sun that cast the divine light upon the neighboring Sephirah. While Tiferoth was the lower sun, what's up, buddy? Casting its rays upon the lower regions. Dath illuminated the upper part of the tree as the second mystical sun. The lower sun was ruled by the archangel Michael, the upper by Lucifer, the bringer of light, residing close to the highest trinity. Now, I find this funny because when we did the show a couple of weeks ago with the Yazidis and Melik Taus, that's how they described in their tradition the connection between Lucifer or Melek Taus, the peacock angel, and the angel Michael. There was that, the way it was described in that hierarchy. And there's, there's a science to that, and one must pay attention to that because it's totally in opposition to the way it's presented in mainstream religion, all right? That's why I think it's important to have a good grasp of this, all right? All right, uh, the bringer of light residing close to the highest trinity, Bina, Chakma, Kepha. Lucifer was the, and that's where they actually get the Father, Son, Holy Spirit from when you transition that into the, into those spiritual mysteries. That's another story. Lucifer was the mediator between the divine light and the lowest spheres. There are many legends of his fall, which is also the fall of death, referring to the sin of pride, the exile of angels from celestial regions, the disobedience of Lucifer against, the God, against God's law, the forbidding union of angels with the daughters of men. That's Genesis 6, 4. You can look that up. What is significant here? When Lucifer death fell, the original cosmic harmony was lost. The divine triad was separated from the lower Sephiroth and death became the abyss. As I said many times before, your fall represents your ascent. 
you, when you fall, you actually weren't falling, you were ascending. You were falling or removing and separating yourself from that mainstream of conformity. So as it said, when Lucifer fell, it created that cosmic disharmony. Notice it used the word disharmony. That represents when we are on this path and we decide to take on the attributes of the isolated consciousness. We create that cosmic disharmony. We're not trying, remember this path is not about trying to become one with everything. See, that's what right hand path is, trying to become one with the universe, trying to become one with nature. We're trying to do the complete opposites. That's not what this path is about. We're trying to maintain the uniqueness about that ourselves with it, which is our individuality, but yet connect to it on a multiversal and universal level. That's what the isolated intelligence represents. We're not trying to merge and become one with anything. And that was what the, that's what the quote unquote symbolic, the fall represented. Lucifer said, listen, man, fuck that. I'm not trying to be down with the crew and the clique. Right? How many how many conformists do we? That unfortunately, there's a lot of people that just want to be down. They don't want to be unique. They don't want to retain their individuality, but yet come together collectively. That's what we do on this path. We retain our individuality, but yet we come together collectively on what the concepts of left hand path represent. So that's why. And that there's a classic example why I don't do the group and click thing no more. That, there's your answer. I don't believe in joining any organizations or signing up for anything. Um, as I said, the only thing I do is classes and consultations. But through my classes, you're not becoming a part of any group or organization. You're taking that individual, you're taking that information and taking it and utilizing it in whatever way you see fit to maintain your individuality and how it connects to the isolated consciousness. That's the difference. Right. So gone are the days of being part of groups and cliques and organizations that have a leader over it. I'm not I'm not. I'm done with that. I, I gave that shit up a long time ago. I ain't trying to be up under anybody. OK, that's the problem with these cliques. This is some supreme leader. And then usually there's a hierarchy that comes after that. Uh, you know, Magus, this epistemist, this high priest, this and, you know, all these titles to feed men's and, and women's egos. And at the end of the day, it absolutely means nothing. Trust me. Because you can call yourself Magus this, Magister that, Epissimus this. When you're walking on the street, you're just a regular motherfucker like everybody else. Nobody cares about that. At the end of the day, it's just a title. And as I said many times before, I've seen this belonging to so many organizations over the last 20 plus years, be it masonry, et cetera, whatever organization it might be. I see so many times where the, the individual doesn't fill the position or the title. They let the title or the position fill them, meaning they let it go to their head. Just because you were given some title, it don't mean shit at the end of the day. Trust me when I tell you, it doesn't mean shit. And I held some of those titles, okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make that clear. Um, so I'm talking about things in reference to uh, – or positions and titles that I myself held in some of those groups and organizations. And I started to become disgusted with it because I, I, I felt it was an ego. It was an ego, uh, you know, trip. It, and, and I saw the game with it. So at the end of the day, that means absolutely nothing. The only thing it means or holds significance to is the individual who thinks it does in their mind. Uh, but anyway, all right. I don't even know where the hell I left off. All right, here we go. Here's where I left off. Uh, okay. The divine tribe was separated from the lowest Sephiroth and death became the abyss. Okay. Man, time's going quick. The gate to the Klepothic anti-worlds in which Lucifer established his pandemonium. For those who do, not, who do not fear to follow Lucifer and separate themselves from the divine order, these anti-worlds are the alternative path of salvation, leading not upwards to the divine light, but downwards into the inner darkness, the very core of being. While the way to God strives to reconstruct the original cosmic order and reunite with the divine brilliance, the initiative of the left-hand path seeks to deepen the fall. 
separate oneself from God's emanations and ignite the spark of Godhood in the darkness of the inner void. Man, I can't, I can't put in a nutshell. Uh -huh. I can't uh, put this in a nutshell. Uh, that's a good explanation to sum this up. All right. The inner spark of Godhood successfully becomes the fiery pillar of ascent on Lucifer's path of ascending flame. Therefore, the light of Lucifer is not the same light as the one recognized by right hand path philosophies. And that's why I said in the very beginning of the video, it's not the same thing. We don't look at light in that same way. And for those that may not be familiar with that, and I'm talking to those that may not know or newer people on the path, we do work with light. As left-hand path practitioners, path to self-mastery, we are constantly seeking light or illumination, right? Which is the intellect, the knowledge. But again, one must go in the darkness to do the work of the light. You don't know what true knowledge or intellect is until you've been bathed and submerged in the darkness because that's where the true essence of your existence lies. When you deal with it from, a, from the deep dark abyss of your subconscious mind, that's where you uncover all aspects of yourself, good and bad. One must know that to master themselves. Remember, know thyself and thou shalt know the gods. If you don't know yourself, you don't, you don't know anything. So the problem is with other systems, it's an outward journey in. Religions, philosophies, dogmas, right-hand path systems, they teach you from an external perspective and they teach you to work your way in. That's, that's, that's totally the, bad, the, the incorrect way to do it in the sense because you can't, you can't seek or look for a creator or a God outside of yourself, okay? So they're teaching you to look out there in Spookyville out there into the skies for some mythological God that doesn't exist when the God you should be looking for resides with inside of you. And this path, that's where we start. That's where the journey begins. We go within ourselves, right? To look for the creator or look for, for the God that, that is us. And that's why I've always said the helping hand you're looking for is at the end of your arm. If you're looking for God, look in a mirror and you will find the very God that they've been programming you from birth to seek out for your guidance and your salvation. But the trick that's been projected through religious dogma, philosophies, faith, and belief systems is to create this fear system that there's this spooky God, old man God with a long white beard sitting on a throne in heaven and he's controlling every aspect of your life. And if you're good, you're gonna go to this place called heaven where these little fat kids floating around with diapers on. If you're bad, you're gonna go to this evil place called hell and be tortured in some flames by some, some uh, pitchfork devil that's on a hot sauce bottle, okay? This is all done by fear and indoctrination. Remember, I read a document uh, a few shows back, I forgot where I, where I took it from, where when the, when, when the, when the church fathers got together, they, they created the concept of heaven and hell for the sole purpose of instilling fear and to mentally indoctrinate people. That's what keeps religion alive. And that's why the weak and the masses fall for it because the fuel to keeping the power of religion going is fear, okay? Fear is what keeps people in check. If I can control your emotions through fear, I can get you to do basically whatever I want. And fear creates another thing called guilt, right? If I instill these systems of indoctrination into you and then another thing that they try to, instilling you is loyalty. When you, when, you, when you violate that loyalty, the guilt sets in and then the fear manifests through the punishment that's gonna be obtained for not being loyal, for not following the rules. But then they'll turn around and tell you in religion, you have free will and you don't. There's a price for that free will. So it's not free, okay? So it's a, it's a system of fuckery that was very well thought out how do we know that? Because to this very day, here we are 2000 plus years later, and we're talking about a religion that has still got the masses in the palm of their hands, still got a large number of people spooked out and indoctrinated. You still got people believing in talking snakes in the garden, still got people believing in uh, mythological creatures mentioned in Job unicorns, still got people in believing in these mythological characters called angels with wings and 
uh, still got people believing that somebody raised their hand and the Red Sea just magically parted. Still got people believing in all this, these fairy tales and mythological things, but we're crazy. The stuff that we're talking about is nonsense, right? You still got people thinking, literally, and this is sad, that somebody actually, and they, they don't think it's symbolic or metaphorical, that a man actually went into the belly of a whale for three days and three nights. And then they want to tell you that Jesus went into the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. Somebody's playing some masonry fuckery on us. They're breaking, they're, they're, they're subliminally, it, it, it's symbolic, but there are people that literally believe these stories. They literally believe that there was this giant called Goliath. Anyway, you get the point. You get the point. That's no different than believing in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. That's no, believe, no different than believing in the Smurfs. That's no different than believing in Santa Claus and the elves. It's no different, people. But when we talk about going within, going... <laughs> Going within to find the truth, that sounds crazy. Why? Because we're not seeking some mythological deity in the sky. We don't believe on this path that there's any old man deity sitting on the throne in heaven, controlling like a puppet master, controlling the strings to the course of our lives. That's a bunch of nonsense. That's spookism. Okay? We don't believe that nonsense. That's fairy tales. Save that for the, you know, for kindergartners and and mythological. We separate ourselves from all that. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. It is not the splendid brilliance of a superior being that initiates to seek, to seeks to unite within. The light shines from within. It is found in the utmost darkness of the inner world. There's a quote in the Gospel of John, the very, very first chapter, first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. I know Christians will tell you that that's Jesus. It sounds good. But if you go into the language it was translated in, you're going to get a whole different breakdown and a whole different meaning. That light that shines in the darkness, that's what I was talking about, is the intellect. And the darkness comprehend the light that shines in the darkness, the darkness comprehends it, it not. Because you can't comprehend it if you do not emerge yourself in the darkness. That's where you find true light, true, true knowledge and intellect. There's many different meanings of that particular uh, quote. Uh, from a mystical, metaphysical, Masonic, and religious perspective. All right. This is a fact. We know, and that's what this term, hence comes the term. One must go into the darkness to do the work of the light. Can't avoid it, people. It is found in the utmost darkness of the inner void, powering up all evolution and growth on the Luciferian path of flames. All right. I am going to stop there. I think I'm going to do a second part of this because there's a couple more sections I want to get to. I'm not going to force this all. In one. I'm definitely going to do a second part to this. I think I'll do the second part on Thursday. Uh, and then we're going to have some guests coming on the following week. Uh, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, I think that kind of uh, touches on. Hold on. Let me make sure. Hmm. Yeah. Hold on. One, two. Uh, you know what? Hold on. Let me, let me, one, two, hold on one second. Two, four. Hold on one second. All right, let me go two more so I can break this up evenly. All right, I'm going to go a little bit further. All right. All right, so it is the fire of the dragon, the flame of self-salvation, the fiery essence of lust and fury, the driving force of self-creation. The light is represented by the torch of the light bearer, one of the most familiar masks of Lucifer. On the other hand, the concept refers to Lucifer's stellar and cosmic nature. He is the star that shines proudly as the brightest object in the sky after the sun and moon. He is also the bringer of fire that is the origin of all things and the patriot god of illumination through the knowledge and wisdom. OK, 
Okay. In this sense, he is identified with Prometheus from the famous Greek myth who brought the divine fire on earth and taught man how to use it. In other words, he endowed man with the soul, the divine fire that taught mankind how to become equal to gods. The esoteric interpretation of the myth explains the gift of fire as the awakening of the inner spark in man, the source of spiritual power, which corresponds to the tantric concept of the Kundalini. The Promethean fire is the inner potential, the spark of divinity within the limitless source of the individual power. As Prometheus teaches mankind how to become like gods, so Lucifer shows man the path of independence and the way to our own godhood. So Lucifer represents showing you the path or the way to, like I said, what does it mean to be a god or a goddess or strive to become one? One must walk the path of Lucifer or take the path of the ascent via Lucifer to come to that realization, all right? This is important, people, okay? Lucifer shows man the path of independence and the way to his own God. And on the other hand, this is the forbidden light now is denied to man. Prometheus is severely punished by the gods. They chain him to a rock, and each day his liver is eaten by an eagle. Sounds fucked up, right? Or a vulture, and grows again so that his pain may last forever. The first couple in the Garden of Eden is exiled, and its gates become forever closed for them and their descendants. The angels who left heaven to fornicate with the daughters of men are imprisoned in the valleys of earth until the day of judgment, when they will be cast into the abyss of fire and confined to the end of all generations. These horrible fates of those who dare to act against the gods show that the gift of Lucifer holds a great power but does not come without a price. And his path is only for those who are willing to accept all that it may bring be it success or failure. As I said before, we take responsibilities on this path for our successes and our failures. We don't blame anybody for that. We don't give anybody credit for our successes either. That's the difference. Whereas other paths, you got a crutch, you got a scapegoat, you got a crutch to lean on. <clears throat> you have an excuse you can use. <clears throat> All right. The bringer of light is the initiator of illumination. This is going to be the last section I'm going to do, and then, then I'm going to stop. In the intellectual and spiritual sense, to many practitioners, he reveals himself as the givers of flame with the Egyptian god Set, who endows man with the gift of consciousness. That's the isolated consciousness I was talking about earlier. Potential godhood and the flame of self-deification, okay? The light of isolation that is different from the torch held by gods and spirits who act as guides and patrons on the path of devotion or the path of priesthood. Lucifer's flame represents the path of isolation or the path of sorcery. Man, I love this shit. Like when I hear this shit, it gets my juices flowing. It gets me amped. It gets me energized because when I'm hearing this stuff, this is the shit I've been craving to hear since the very first day I set foot on this planet. This is to me what always has been missing, quote unquote, from consciousness. This is what reminds me of what I didn't, couldn't figure out years back when I was in them conscious circles, what was lacking, what was missing. There was still something missing. I knew it back then, but I just couldn't, I couldn't figure it out or piece it together when I was young back then. When I hear this breakdown and I hear stuff like this, it's like putting the, the pieces to this jigsaw puzzle together and, it, and it, 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 it just creates all these inner DNA explosions. You could feel the presence of this just emanating through your DNA and your RNA, which is what I call and refer to as raising yourself to the realization of truth. That's when truth manifests and becomes a reality. That's what I mean when I say, is there such a real thing as pure undiluted truth? It's a matter of perspective and who is perceiving it. Most people on the surface will say yes, but in essence, truth is personal. Truth only becomes a reality when the individual can confirm that truth to be a reality to them. Just because somebody reads something from a book about Horace and all go, yeah, uh-huh, that doesn't make it pure, undiluted truth. It just means a bunch of motherfuckers agreed on the same concept. That's all it means. But this here ignites and sparks an awakening within that can only be described in very limited words. It's a, it's a feeling that's hard to put. When I'm just reading it, it just, 
explosions go off within me. I, I mean, just the, the, the energy, because I know in essence, this is truly who and what we are. This has been stripped from us. This has been forbidden to be taught to us. We've been sidetracked with so much bullshit, be it from mainstream society through educational institutions, the media, TV, movies, uh, and then obviously the number one indoctrinator religion. And most of us were exposed to it from a very early age. Most of us grew up in upbringings and, and households where it was there on some level, some more than others. But regardless, if it wasn't there, we grow up in a society that's influenced by it. And that's a reality, right? Anyway, these two concepts are connected with the two antinomian ways rooted in the East and known as the way of janana, knowledge, and the way of bhakti, devotion. In the form of the adept seeks illumination within following the guidance of an internal guru. In the latter, the adept maintains continuous devotion to an entity viewed as being outside of the self, right? We talked about that just a short while ago. The light bearer teaches that the way of Luciferian illumination is the way inwards. I've been saying that shit for years. The search for experience within. Everyone may carry the flame and everyone may become the light bearer in one's own right. There is no single God, spirit, or man who can claim the title for oneself. His light is the flame of self-awareness, the active solar aspect of self-deification. In rites of magic, the gnosis of the light bearer is revealed through visions, sensations, and personal insights. His energy is either calm and soothing or fierce and fiery. His sigil transformed to the shape of a human or demonic figure holding two flames and uniting them into one flame, the light of illumination, godhood. I work with this trident symbol all the time in my ritual lifts to work. The pentacles are seen as a crown surrounding Lucifer's head, burning or forming the shape of his horns. The flame becomes a scorch and resembling the fire on the head of Baphomet. The fire is purifying and empowering, cleansing the body and strengthening the aura. This flame is the gift of the light bearer hand it over to the initiate in symbolic act of awakening and activating the powers of self-destruction and self-creation within. Notice it said self-destruction and self-creation. One must destroy all those ways about themselves that are, are, are hindering them or holding them back of evolving spiritually into what they can become and then create the new ways about themselves that's gonna raise them to a level of a god or a goddess. That's the difference. So we must deconstruct and reconstruct. I talk about that all the time. That's what the path that Lucifer represents. Not many people are willing to go through the destruction process, unfortunately, because it's not a very pleasant thing sometimes. But Lucifer shows you by guiding you down that path, this is what you need to fucking destroy about yourself, annihilate, and reconstruct and rebuild it. Now, Azazel represents the path, takes on a different mass of elusive as being the willing adept or initiate to do that. So when one activates the energy of Azazel, he is activating the en energy to take that journey, to take that uh, uh, path intentionally. Actually, something's just sparking me to get it. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get my consecrated Lucifer image that, that, I, that I work with and this shit is fine. And someone's just giving me the, the intuition to get it. And I'm gonna get it. This is this is this is this is my bad boy that I consecrated and worked with. But there's a lot of symbolism on this. I want you to you see the earth, you see the serpent, you see the, the symbol of Lucifer in his angelic form of light ruling over the earth. There's a lot of symbolicism with this. So when you do work on this path, you want to find when you're working with imagery or or something that you've consecrated that has uh, you know a connection because it should have a personal connection with you that awakens uh, or activates a certain energy within yourself. I'm gonna bag it up so you guys can see that. I know you can see most of it, but 
Um, but there should be some significance there. The imagery should speak to you. So when I see this, right, you, you hear that saying, he's got the whole world in his hands. We all heard that song. When I look at this, it represents rulership, deification, self-deification on that path, everything that we talked about tonight. When I, like, when I connect imagery or, or, or do work on my altar, it has to speak or activate something within. That's the importance of imagery. And that's the beauty uh, uh, of this. Every time I look upon this, it activates a lot of the things we just went through in that last paragraph. That is, is immediately what it connects to. And it has a strong presence or energy. As immediately when I've seen it, um, that's kind of what, what, what connected or resonated, right? Uh, let me finish this last section, last paragraph. Uh, Okay. What's up, honey? All right. So this last paragraph. Paragraph in the rites of magic, the narcissus. of the light bearer is revealed through vision, sensations, and personal insights. His energy is either calm and soothing or fierce and fiery. His sigil transforms into the shape of a human or demonic figure holding two flames and uniting them in one flame, the light of illumination and God. Okay, we read this, I'm sorry. Uh, the flame is the gift of the light bearer handed over to the initiate in a symbolic act of awakening and activating the, this way we left off the powers of self-destruction and self-creation within. I'm sorry. The two flames depicted in the sigil become rays of light, blue, red, silver, and golden or red and black, entwining and uniting in the solar plexus, the center of the fire and the subtle body of the initiate. The common element in these visions is brightness, light, and fire. Flames assuming the form of serpents, tridents on fire, torches, reptilian eyes, Surrounded by fire, etc. The light bearer himself comes as a wingman, a horned figure with long horns, or a human being with a dark body. He looks stellar and is cloaked with the night sky. All right, I'm gonna stop there. I think you get the point. Okay. So let me put that over there. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to keep Lucifer with us today. We're going, to, we're going to keep my boy with us today. <laughs> All right, let me stop. I just had this compelling thing, and I usually don't do that, but something just told me to grab it. Look, if I put it like that, it looks like a, no, it's not, it looks like a shirt, right? I think I got it like a uh, beard. Yeah, let me stop. All right, um, I'm going to go through some questions. Uh, 917, I'm going to stay on for about 20 more minutes again. Uh, only due to the fact that I do have to get to some personal stuff that I need to do. All right. I'm going to go to the top of the chat and just take uh, your, your questions. Uh, T. Wells for president. I appreciate the uh, donation. Uh, again, just I, I never really mentioned and I keep forgetting the channel is monetized. You can make a donation right here on the channel if you see the where you see the dollar sign or you can actually go to my PayPal, which I've been putting in the description box and just use the email canoom19 at gmail.com. You can donate to the channel that way, too. Always appreciated. Not necessary, but always appreciated. All right. I'm just going to go through questions. Matthew Watson, yes, that is a good a good concept. Something you typed in earlier, uh, Lucifer being another symbol of yin and yang, most definitely, because we know the concept of yin and yang is is balancing the harmony of of what one would say positive and negative, or in this case, where we're using the concept of excuse me, light and darkness. All right, so yes, that would be a good metaphor. And that's what I've said, and I, I've taught this many times through the concept of Set and Heru. You're getting another concept of it tonight. Set and Heru represent 
the harmony of those light and dark forces. That's what it's about. Both are needed. Both need to be obtained in order to master self. And that's why I said before, there's, there's this, uh, you know, misinterpretation on this path that we don't work with what one would call light energy. But having said that, as you saw what we went through earlier, we were clear on the explanation of what light represents to us on this path. Okay. But yes, good point. Yeah, Alicia Molina, I believe you, you're going to be one of those coming. Uh, we have that gathering in New York on the 17th. I'm looking forward to, I always look forward to coming home, seeing family, seeing friends. I try to go a couple times a year. Uh, but the beauty of it is, as much as I love New York, uh, I don't miss spending winters there and some of the other bullshit. It is too much nonsense you can get into up there. Uh, but you always just miss it. Home is home. Anyway, all right, what else we got? That's funny comment there, but Matthew, again, facts. All my family think I'm running around like a Sith Lord and shit. And when I show them the facts, it's never ending loop of ignorance. Yeah, um, that's a touchy subject. And I just got an email uh, about a week or so ago. And I'll get this topic occasionally through emails. Uh, how does one, you know, continue their relationship with direct family members when they're on this path? And it's a very good question. It seems to be an issue on some level uh, that, that affects people. Now, my answer to that is briefly, and, I'm, and you bringing this up reminded me of that email. So for those that might have that issue where you're living in a household where you got family who might be religious or Christian, um, here's my thoughts on that. One, um, first of my situation, I'm fortunate where, you know, my main family members pretty much know my, my, my path. And because they're not really religious, even though we all came up Catholic, but we abandoned that long time ago. They're very open-minded. Uh, I don't really have that issue, but for those that do a few points of suggestion, one, if you have the ability to have your own living space, that's step one. Now I know some people don't have that ability. Some people are forced to be in certain situations. You might be young and you're not out on your own yet, or you're just not in a financial situation to have your own space. That's usually the best solution having your own privacy and space I found is very important. Now I myself have been an independent individual since I left my house when I, when I graduated high school by choice. Cause I've always felt I needed the, uh, uh, the need for my own privacy. So that's obviously the best solution. If you're in a position to do it, if you can uh, obtain your own private living space. Now, if you're in a situation where you can't and you have to deal with family, Here's some, here's some suggestions I would make to you. I wouldn't badger them and fight and argue with them. If you can hold intelligent conversation with them and agree to disagree, that's one thing. Remember, we don't try to convert or badger people on this, but we're not trying to convert anybody to anything. I want to make that clear. So one, you got to also understand this. If you're living in somebody else's household, and I'm speaking maybe to the younger people, you know, there's something my parents always told me, and I, and I say that to my kids growing up, and it's true. My mother used to say, you live in my house, you live by my rules. You got to understand that it's not your house. You ain't paying all the bills. You, you're going to have to uh, uh, adjust yourselves to, to those rules and regulations. And if you don't, you're going to have to find a way to go on your own. So understand, if you're living in your parents' house or you're living in the house of a family member who holds that authority over you, unfortunately, you've got to find a way to keep that harmony. Uh, you're not going to keep it by trying to badger them. And, and pound them with information that they don't want in the first place. Do you understand that? Uh, so un first, know your situation. That's key. So you live in the house of your parents or somebody that's above you. You live by their rules. That's, that's just the way it is. That's why I said one of the best solutions is get your own living space if you can. If not, you try not to be argumentative, uh, but they'll respect you by your example you set. They may not agree with your spiritual path, but if they say, look, this is a productive person, they, they handle their business, they take care of their personal stuff, 
Uh, so your example is what will get them to at least respect you. So if you're acting like a buffoon and an idiot and you're trying to fight them and you're in their house, that's not going to work. Okay. Um, but everybody's situation is different. Maybe you got members like that. You can clown around with them and, 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 and debate and fuss and fight with them. But I'm saying, like I said earlier, know your situation. It is, it is an issue that comes up and I do get emails frequently about that throughout the course of it, you know, over the year, I might get several a year on that. Uh, how do I stay on this path? You know, we'll work this path without, you know, having to deal with that heat. Well, know your situation. <sighs> Sorry. Sorry, people. Been up since 4 a.m. as usual. All right. What other questions we got? Oh, Scott. E. Nosferatu Kali has always been blue skin in my dreams. And I, I know that probably came up when I was talking about seeing deities. And that's probably more than likely, I'm going to assume, that's the most popular image that's promoted of Kali. When you see that picture of her with that bluish skin tone. And a lot of the statues, the, 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 a lot of the statues that are available today depict Kali like that. Now, I'm assuming, I would assume that's probably why. And that, again, goes back to my point. When you constantly uh, stamp an image in your subconscious mind, that's how it's going to manifest. Uh, and again, yeah, I'm going to read the reminder that Raven put in earlier. Um, the summer classes start this Saturday, July 20, 3 p.m. Um, I put a final notification out there on the Instagram and the Facebook. Um, you can sign up until Friday. It'll be the cutoff day to sign up. So if you want to sign up, you can still sign up for that. Uh, feel free. Um, we also have the ritual in Fort Lauderdale, August 30th, Friday night, 8 p.m. The ritual, the pentagram of set. Must uh, contact me at my email for an invite. Um, uh, we have the event in October, 25th to the 27th, the three-day event. I uh, already have two people that have contacted me that are coming to present in addition to what we have on the itinerary. Uh, so we will still, if people would like to present a cult or left-hand path topic and are coming, contact me, and we will get you on the itinerary space permitted. Uh, as soon as space runs out, we'll cut that off because uh, we have to stay, obviously, within a certain time uh, constraint. Uh, and then again, uh, I also put out on Instagram and Facebook today uh, the type of readings I do off because people have been asking that. So I put it out there. Uh, if you want, and contact me for a reading or a consultation, but the type of readings that I offer, uh, you can do a reading with the uh, Goetia and the demonic or the Klebothic deities. You can do a reading with the Atiru via the Egyptian runes. You could do a reading with the spirits of the dead. You could do a reading with the Loa, the Vudon deities. You could do a reading with the Orishi. Uh, so you could specify if you're interested in doing a reading and consulting uh, one of those particular systems. All right. Email is right there. You'll see it. And Raven put it in also, kunum19 at gmail.com. All right. What else we got? Hey, uh, yes, there are female angels uh, and female demons. Now, uh, I don't know if you study, depends on uh, which system you study. They do mention, if you're familiar with, in some of the Hebrew mysticism of the 200 fallen angels, and you pull up their names, you will see a list of some female uh, angels, uh, quote unquote, or what we're calling angels. So yes, they do exist. Um, also, we know there are in the Klopathic realm uh, and the Goetia, there's a lot of female uh, demonic energies too. And those, in a sense, they are a form of that in a sense, but not from a religious perspective. But yes, when you look up the 200 fallen angels, you will see feminine names. Now in religion and what we know as Hebrew Christianity and Is Islam, uh, I'm, I could be wrong. I can't recollect one from a religious perspective. To my knowledge, most of them are men, but we know that was done intentionally because religion is a very patriarchal uh, male chauvinistic doctrine. Everything is male. Uh, so anyway. Uh, Mitchell Ford, uh, I don't know if you're new to the channel. Uh, yeah, this the channel has been on for a couple of years. And I'm pretty much on every Tuesday and Thursday night, if that's what you were referring to earlier. All right. 
that's what we got. All right, Matthew says, what's a good ritual to start work with Lucifer and any, any altar tips for him? Well, the book that I was reading from just earlier, The Rites of Lucifer, right? This is a great book. It's, it's not a complicated read. It has some basic work you can do in here, setting up an altar. Now, as far as setting up an altar, you'll find some basics in there. There's basic starting points and work that you can do, invocations, rites, meditations, visualizations. Uh, I work with the Draconian couple, as I, as I mentioned before, I, I myself am a member of the Temple of the Ascended Flame, but I work with the Draconian or the Dragon Current. So why is that important in decorating your altar? As you've seen, I put some clips up on the Instagram. I, I like to put a load of red and black candles because those are the primordial colors of working with this energy, red especially. I like to have imagery on there. I have a, a dragon on there. Uh, I have a Baphomet on there. Anything that connects with the symbol symbolicism of the dragon and the Lucifer current, any any aspect of the adversary, which I keep many on there, set, Baphomet, this image of Lucifer. So it's about really getting creative. Now, I wouldn't necessarily rely just on what's in books. And the one thing about the rights of Lucifer, it doesn't really tell you a specific way that's mandatory to do it. Uh, it just gives you some of the basic implements. I say get creative with your own intuition. What, is it, what does it mean and represent to you, right? So I just go with the flow. I go with my intuition. So I like to put all those aspects and imagery that connect with Lucifer. As I said, Baphomet, set, this image of Lucifer. I have Lilith on my altar, right? I want that. I want to also represent that feminine to create that harmony between the masculine and feminine energies. Because remember, it talked about Lucifer always having that counterpart that, that represents that harmony, whether it's masculine, feminine, light, darkness. Uh, and then I mostly just use red and black candles. Uh, in different varieties. I like to use tea lights. I'll use tapers. I'll use glass candles. I like a very mystical, ancient type of vibe to my altar. That's just me. Uh, some people don't use or work with any imagery. It's, you know, I do that too sometimes, depending on what I'm doing and where I'm at. But I like a lot of, a lot of mystical uh, and ancient type of imagery. It just enhances my work. Uh, so as far as setting up an altar, and for those that's taken the class, I believe week three or four, we're going through a whole, it's going to be a whole three, four hour seminar on working the path of Lucifer. Um, we're going to be getting into all those things. That's, that's kind of what I do. I go a little bit more in depth and personal in the classes, uh, but that's just to throw some basics out there. All right. Yeah, that's true. Mitchell Ford type thing. It's the jealous God. As he said, he only lives through fear and killing bloodshed. He is jealous because he knows there is something much greater and real than he is. I'm a jealous God. Fifth Sephiroth. That's right. And I, and, and I never understood that even in the Bible when it said in Genesis, I'm the Lord your God. Have, have no other gods before me. I am a jealous God. Jealous of what? How can you be the uh, all encompassing creative God, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God, what are you jealous of if you have control and power of everything? Or what God are we really talking about? There's just so many different contradictions and fuckery. It doesn't make sense. Uh, Tarek, ultimate of all things, fear is controlling your emotions when they are not there. That's true. Yeah, good to see you here, uh, Brother Wacky J. Uh, I know you've been busy, um, but uh, always good. At least you're keeping up. Angel, brother Angel, peace from the boogie down. I'm watching my damn Yankees right here, man. I don't know what the fuck is going on. Struggling. Can't uh, three to two. He keep fucking blowing opportunities. That's why you see keeping me look to the left. I got the I got the Yankee game on my phone. I'm watching it to the left. As you know, I'm a fanatical fucking Yankee fan. Obvious, right? Uh, and I will be visiting. Uh, my Yankees when I come up there. Uh, they're pissing me off last night and tonight. They better, find, they better find a way to pull this damn game out tonight. Running out of at-bats, man. I got four more outs. And they're still down by one run. Uh, but peace to you, brother. Matthew. Matthew's got some good questions, man. You guys should follow his lead. 
Can doing offerings and libations strengthen the bond with deities even if you never worked with them? Yes, it can. But I would tell you to be cautious because when you're doing offerings and libations, you should be knowledgeable of the deity or the entity you're working with because sometimes that creates the thirst or the hunger. It, it, they, they, they request it more. And sometimes you're opening up energy connections with that deity you may not be aware of. Uh, so yes, it can, but I wouldn't recommend going it in, into it not knowing what libations and offerings you're doing for what deity and what purpose they serve because you may not, you may be bringing unwanted energy or attention to yourself that you may not really want to deal with or be prepared for. So yes, the answer to your question is it can, even if you've never worked with them, but you at least want to be educated to what you're working with. Yeah, you don't need to be, you don't need to get a connection and be working with them for five, 10 years. I mean, I know, I know in some systems they'll tell you that. No, what it takes is sincerity, a good, honest intent, and educating yourself on what you're working with. As long as you apply those concepts, you will get results. Guarantee it. But I wouldn't recommend, oh, let me do some type of, oh, there we go. There we go. Did he hit a home run? The judge just hit a home run. Was that a foul ball? Fuck, man. Had me all excited. Went on the other side of the foul ball. Son of a bitch. Damn, sidetrack. Uh, but yeah, educate yourself to what you're working with. So yes, as long as you know that, yeah, you can make that connection right away. Yes, that's one concept, Alicia. Illumination is found through the work on the root chakra, the red devil, Kundalini rising. Yes, when it was talking about it, made reference to that. In one of the sections I was reading, yes, there is a connection with that as far as what you're talking about with the Kundalini. So most definitely. And that's the beauty of this. There's so many different methods to connect to the understanding of what this shit is about. And like I said, it's talking about it. It gets me amped, man. Like it just makes me feel, uh, I, oh, he did it. He hit a foul ball and he just hit a two-run homer. <laughs> Bottom of the eighth. They're going crazy in the Bronx right now. That's a huge home run. They better close it out. Fucking Chapman's ass last night choked. Oh, I'm sorry, people. I'm getting amped up. I'm talking about Lucifer and the Yankees. That's like a bad combination for me. Man, needed that shit. Anyway, but yes, uh, Alicia, good point. Oni, what's going on? Oni, 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 Oni. I know you heard. You know we haven't. Uh, we're gonna be there in August. If you haven't heard, I know you in Brooklyn because I've been out your way. We're going to be meeting on Saturday, August 17th in Midtown Manhattan. We're having a meetup with everybody in New York. So if you're still on here, uh, hopefully you can make that gathering. Um, so I want to put that out there. Uh, and then maybe one of them days we can swing out that way. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Oh, okay. You did say can't see you in August. Cool. Oh, so you do know. Okay, cool. Jeremy, Cali Durga in my heart. That's what I'm talking about. Cali Durga represents destruction and reconstruction. That to me is the most powerful path of Cali. Oh shit. Oh, that was the same home run. I saw a replay. I'm thinking it's a new home run. Uh, yeah, Cali Durga represents. Uh, that's a great, if you're connected with that, that's, that's awesome. Uh, hey, yeah, and Baphomet on the mind. I like that. Yes, Blair. I don't know if you came on late. I was talking about that in the beginning. The all, most of the, the they are different aspects of Lucifer, and that's what I meant earlier when I was talking about. People will always ask uh, when when you hear Samael, Satan, Lucifer, Set, are they different deities or are they the same thing? They're different aspects of the same thing. They personify anthropomorphically or human form in different aspects, so they take on a different form, creating the illusion that they're different entities. Remember. It's all the same energy, but that energy can personify in multiple manifestations. See, remember, by essence, we are all beings of light and energy. This has been taught for years in many esoterical systems. The Rosicrucians teach this, right? We're all beings of light and energy, right? But that light and energy can take on multitude of, of incarnations and personifications, okay? So yes, they're different aspects. Oni, the lowest and the voodoo are hungry. Once you give them attention, I work with Azili Danto on Thursdays, Saturdays. Yes, you got to be educated to what you are 
uh, working with. Very important. Very important. Uh, what the fuck happened? Uh, Mitchell Ford says, Bilal been calling me. I understand him. Been studying on this on his energy sick at this point in my life. I feel like it's the right time to woke up, assess myself with that day to your thoughts. Bilal is a very fierce warrior, great aspect to work with destruction. And let me say this in, 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 in working with Bilal, okay? Bilal is not a force to, to, to be played with. Now, if you feel the connection and you're certain of the connection, Bilal is, is a master adept and sorcerer of Lucifer. Uh, he can be a vicious uh, archetype and used in working destructive magic on something or somebody. Um, but I like to work with Bilal as a destructive force to destroy things within myself. Bilal can definitely uh, take you to levels of change that I'd be here all night talking about. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. Be prepared. It's a roller coaster ride. Blau is raw and aggressive. He, he is the personification of the demonic realm and everything it represents. He is one of the commanding forces or aspects of Lucifer. Um, and we work with him on this path. He has his own sigil. He has his own role, his own function. He is part of that demonic, clipothic, uh, 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 void and darkness, uh, you know, whole concept and realm. Uh, but a very powerful, dark, black magician. Um, so as long as you feel that connection and, and it sounds like it from your statement, uh, that would be my thoughts and tips. If, if you feel the connection and you got a good vibe within yourself and, and, and you're aware and you're, you're knowledgeable to what you're working with, I'd say go for it. Okay. A good way to get Lilith's attention is I find a, a, a very basic way is by drawing her sigil um, and using it as a porthole or a gateway to connect with her via a meditation, a vigil, a ritual. Um, as I mentioned before, I did a video on Lilith. Uh, I find anointing the sigil with bodily fluids activate her presence when you're doing an invocation. It could be sexual fluids or just pricking your finger and drawing a small plant of blood like you would when you, we made packs when we were kids as blood brothers, you know, I'm talking about, you know, take, take your ritual blade and just prick your finger and offer a little bit of blood to activate the sigil. Uh, I found that to be a very effective, uh, Lilith is very enhanced, it's very, her passion is ignited when you use bodily fluids. Um, I found just a simple meditation invocation uh, is good via her sigil. A good book to start out with, in my opinion. Oh, shit. Didi just hit a grand salami. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm into this game, man. They're going fucking nuts over there. That's a huge hit. Didi just went yard on a grand salami. Um, I'm sorry, people. I know some people don't give a fuck about baseball, but I do. Uh, anyway, that's the man right there. Um, a good book is Bal Cadman's Lilith Magic. That's a great book. It's, and again, one thing I've always said about uh, Brother Bal Cadman, he has a gift of making and presenting work in a very simple way. And he has very powerful uh, rituals in there. He has, he has a lot of good stuff for growth. But to me, one thing that separates him from other authors and other work, he's been blessed with the gift to present it and in, 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 a, in a very simple way where you don't need to be a guru. Uh, I found his, his Kali Mantra magic book has done wonders for me. When I first stumbled across that a few years ago, uh, the rituals in there are very easy. You can be an advanced practitioner or you can be a brand spanking newbie on this path. It doesn't matter. Val Cadman, uh, if you're looking to do a lot of work with, uh, you know, he deals with a lot of mysticism and he, he covers left-hand path top. A lot of you are familiar with him, but I'm talking to those that are not. Uh, but to your question, his Lilith Magic book is a great starting point. I definitely would recommend that. Check that book out. Oh, damn, watch that replay, boy. Dee Dee's Dee Dee. like, what? In your face, biatch. I'm talking about. 
All right, what else we got? Uh, Oni says, yes, Brother B, I'm still here just doing my shadowy self work right now. I've been watching. Cool. Good to see you. Good. Venus Sirenus. I thought the deities were energies in your subconscious. So how can, um, maybe I'm not understanding your question. It's not it's not how can they offend you. It's how you can activate them wrong to cause problems for yourself. They are. They do manifest or the point of origin of them is in your subconscious mind. But when you're working with the energy and you're not conscious uh, or fully aware, the only way, uh, and again, I might be misunderstanding your question, the only way it could not work out for you, you could have issues or problems is you might not know how to facilitate the energy. The only way that can happen is based on just your carelessness and your approach. That's all. Um, but that's what it means when it says all is mental, mental is all. The universe is mental. But there's a point in that projection. Like I say, it's you, the individual, is what manifests them in what other shape or form you see fit. Um, where it can go wrong is in your approach is how you can cause an offense more so to yourself. Let me give you an example. Years back, and I mentioned this on an older show a few years back, there was a Latino brother. Uh, and at that time, we were dealing heavily with uh, Voodoo, working with Paulo. And there was a ceremony and a ritual that was being done. And it was an intense ritual and intense work. And this brother probably got involved on a level he shouldn't have. And what it wound up doing, because, again, of not going in prepared, it created some psychological imbalances after that ritual. He went through some stuff. That's where it can go amok. It can happen. Um, it can happen only if you're careless. So you're still responsible. So there's no external thing uh, controlling it. That's why I said for your successes and your failures, you're responsible. But I have seen people over the years connect to a certain energy via their subconscious and it, 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 it can do detrimental damage on a psychological and a mental and emotional level. And only via the carelessness and the approach or the lack of knowledge in the approach. That's what I was talking about right now. I don't know if that's what you're referring to, but maybe you'll type in something later down. Um, I'm not, maybe I'm not understanding the spelling of, hold on. I'm not, no, what happened there? Damn. Give me one second. Oh, my shit disconnected. My game this can I give me one second. game back on. Hold on a second, people. All right. Um, Frog, God, what's your view on Benajet? Maybe I'm not understanding the spelling, or maybe I'm not saying, saying something there. Uh, so maybe give me a little more info. I'll be not recognizing the uh, spelling. Or maybe I know it's spelled another way is what I'm trying to say. All right. Uh, damn. Fuck, 
there they go. Oh, peace, Damien. Damien, good to see you back here, brother. Good movie I watched last week with a lot of esoteric occult reference. It was called Hereditary. Yeah, I saw it. They touched on the Goetia and a bit of the Damon Pimer. The way that ended was crazy. That's a good movie. So I won't ruin it, but yeah, uh, it's centered around the Goetia demon Paimon or Paimon, as some say. If you haven't seen that movie, uh, check it out. Some good stuff encoded in there. It's crazy the way the movie ended, though. Uh, Damien said, I had a question in the movie. It was more shown in a horror type, like true. They spooked it. Have every work explored that day in your Luciferian work? I was reading about him being the holder of secret knowledge. Um, yes, I have worked with Paimon. When I do a lot of Goetia demonic readings, I, I work with Paimon through a lot through that. It's a very uh, intense, aggressive, uh, violent type of energy, but that can be applied on a multitude of levels. So yes, I have worked with him on some levels. I've never personally constructed a specific working ritual for Paymon. I basically work with him through deviation via communications uh, with clients. He has come through in readings when I'm doing a Goetia or a demonic reading. Yes, I work with him mostly in that sense. Uh, and you are right, the movie is, but you got to understand when they make these movies, of course, they add the Hollywood element to it, right? Matthew, it's only a good idea to get Sir Giles' tattoos, which I have, uh, if you know the significance they hold, one, what they mean, and, and their connection with you. I got these a few years back because that right there is the cop, the soul, right? That, that represents to me or embodies the very essence of what this connects to is about. That has a multitude of meanings, as you know, the all-seeing eye. In my case, it represents the eye of Lucifer. Some will say the eye of Horus, the eye of Ra, the all-seeing eye of God. And this is the Sa symbol of protection, right? I got those Sejirs, and obviously the Ankh means many different things. I got those Sejirs years back at that time because of what they represent. I would only get Sejirs if they hold, don't just get them because they look cool. Because remember, Sejirs carry energy, so make sure the energy holds a significance to you. So yeah, you can get any sigil tattoo or anything that you want, uh, but it's just like, you remember a few years back where everybody was getting Chinese symbols and writings and didn't even know what the fuck it was? So don't do something and you don't know what it means or holds no significance to you. But yes, if it has some significance to you, uh, most definitely. Yeah, that, that's a lot of cinnamon and sage. God damn, fucking can't close a fucking game out, man, but cleanly. Jesus, fuck, I swear. Yes, you're right. This, this particular image of Lucifer can look very similar to the gargoyles you see on the Gothic and the ancient churches. Not a coincidence, right? Why would you have gargoyles? You see them on a lot of the old Gothic Catholic churches. If gargoyles are evil, why even have a representation of it? I don't care if you call them cherubim or whatever you're calling them. Why even have a representation when you're teaching one thing that it's evil or negative, but then you're showing it as a symbol of protection? Uh, yes, and I, I call him Lou. This is Lou, AKA Lou, Lucifer. But me and him, he, he calls me Brother B and, and, and I call him Lou. That's my boy Lou right here. See, when you develop that relationship with Lucifer, you, have, you can give him a nickname, he's cool with it. So I, I, you know, I call him Lou, a.k.a. Lulu. Let me stop. Yeah, DD turned up. You ain't lying, though, Raven. But need to have a clean in. I got one out first and second. I mean, they should close it out, but damn. And, and Judge turned up. He hit that foul ball that just missed, and then came right back. And Yeah, man, I wish I was at that game tonight. I hope the game we go to is going to be on fire. It's always great, man, go in the middle of a playoff race. Uh, all right. Yeah, Jeremy confirmed what I said earlier about Cadman's book, uh, The Magic of Lily. It's a good book. And again, uh, to me, Brother Bao has the gift of making things very simple. So definitely check that out. Right, Mitchell. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they use King or Paimon, but yeah, as 
Damien Damien said earlier, they added their own twist and spin. Uh, they use aspects of King Parman. Uh, but yes, that's not when you're studying the Goetia and or you're studying, uh, you know, the demonic entities or bands. Yeah, that's not what it represents. They made it look all horrific and evil, just like they do everything else. Yeah, and it's yeah, they it's a Hollywood thing they created, right? All right, what do we got here? Oh shit. That's some good question. Damn, what happened here? Okay. Yes, Venus, you can activate whether you're conscious of it or not. You can activate an energy you're not ready for, most definitely. And I'm talking about psychologically and mentally, that's all. Um, and that's where it all centers again around you. You're your you're your greatest asset or your greatest enemy. That's it. So in essence, you're still in control. You still facilitate it, but sometimes, look at it this way. It's like a computer. When a computer's hard drive is overloaded with information, it crashes. The brain is like a subconscious mind. When you overload it with information and knowledge and intellect that's not ready to absorb, your mind, your subconscious mind can overload, and this is what creates nervous breakdowns, uh, uh, personality disorders, uh, bipolar so most definitely, that's a scientific fact. That, that is not uh, a theory. It is not a myth. We know what levels of stress or, or things that we're not prepared to take on can create and what it can activate with us on, on a mental level. So I'm talking mostly from a mental, emotional, and a spiritual perspective. Mm. All right. Uh, Matthew, a good way to get this this on a on a dream or astral level. I find an effective way you could take any of these deities, gaze upon their sigil and meditate on their sigil right before you go to bed and capture that image and keep it in your mind's eye. And I guarantee you that will open a doorway to connect through dreams and astral. You can create your own invocation. But I find doing it right before bedtime, getting yourself in a relaxed, receptive mind, gazing upon the sigil, open yourself up to the thoughts of that deity via the sigil, capture it in your mind's eye, and then, and then retire to bed. And if you tend to wake up at some point in the night, have the sigil handy and stare at it again before you go back to sleep. That's a great way to activate, uh, a very simple, basic way, all right? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of good books out. Uh, the Rites of uh, Lucifer. I mean, uh, a good book I just got, you might want to check out, uh, Draconian Egyptian Grimoire by Bill Davenback. Uh, this gets into a lot of Egyptian black magic. This book just came out in May. I plan on going through some stuff in here. Uh, another good book here. I went over this last week, Visions of the Night Side. Uh, this one right here, this is not for the weak at heart. This is the Grimoire of Tiamat. Uh, this is an excellent book here. Don't fuck around with this though. If you're not ready for this, this will open up doors on a mental level. Uh, I haven't even touched on it yet. I, I, I'm, I'm doing some work with that. I'm, I'm doing a lot of work right now. I'm getting some stuff together. Uh, those are the, some, uh, some of the more recent ones. Uh, there was another Luciferian book I just picked up, um, from, Richie K. Pages, the one I didn't have, uh, Luciferian Exogenes. Uh, Exogenes, uh, that's another one. Um, a lot of good books out. Um, I'm gathering, uh, some, but this is the most recent one, uh, Draconian Egyptian Magic by Bill Davindak, uh, or Duvindak, I'm sorry, I always say his name wrong. Uh, this is a very good book. I'm in the mystic order. The Fury of Set is another book, which I have over there, I don't have here. I'd get The Fury of Set. Let me see if I have it over here. Uh, the name of it is The Fury of Set. That's another real good book uh, that works with set on a whole nother level. Um, I would also suggest uh, uh, some good reads too, in addition. Uh, uh, um, the Companion to the Satanic Bible, The Satanic Rituals, the Yazidi book that I went over a couple of weeks ago um, by Joseph Anya. I would definitely check that book out. Um, there's a lot of good books out, man.
Good question, Wild Child Tarot. Um, that's a very good question because, you know, uh, I don't know how old the child is. Maybe you can type in down how old the child is. Very good question. Um, if it's a very young child, um, I wouldn't let them see you do anything intense that they may not understand. Um, like my youngest child is six. He sees my altars and imagery. I don't really conduct any ritualistic work in front of him, but he is very conscious of, he calls it my God stuff is what he'll call it. My dad's God stuff. Um, and I, I'll tell him the basics. Uh, so it's okay to expose them to the basics. Um, depends on how old the child is and some, some are more mature than others. So it just depends. I wouldn't expose them to anything that's intense or anything they wouldn't understand. Um, but they should be uh, knowledgeable to some fact of what you deal with. Again, I don't know how old the child is. So I'll keep that in mind. Age definitely has a lot to do with it. Uh, Matthew, that's actually a good question. Don't really have an answer for that. Why do Goetic demons have names that sound like Pokemon names? That's, that's funny. You're right. I, I couldn't tell you that. Some of it's from the or Remember, some of it, these names are odd from, remember, when you're looking at a lot of those uh, Goetia demonic names, you're seeing a combination of Latin, French, German, Greek, Arabic, Hebrew. Because it's been filtered down through so many different systems, ancient and modern, Greek too, you'll see some Greek. Uh, to me, that would be part of the explanation, but you're right. It is funny. They got some crazy ass names. I really don't have a def definitive answer for you on that. Goddess within the abyss. Do you think some intense repeating numerical synchronicities, depending on the individual's own experience, could lead someone subconsciously or not to be further guided? Yes. Uh, most definitely by the repetitiveness of numbers. And if they're synchronizing with certain events and you're seeing them all the time, I've talked about that in the past, most definitely. Those are personal messages from your subconscious. They're trying to communicate to you a personal message. Now, obviously, always break the numbers up because, like, let me give you an example. If I was seeing 555 all the time, you always remember when you're dealing with numerology, it's not always the number on the surface. You, you add them up. That's the actual number it is. So if I add 55 five and 5 up, I get 15. But then I, I add those two numbers separate, I get 6. That rep, that's the number we know what 6 represents. That's how you want to look at it. People always say I'm seeing 7s all the time or I'm seeing the combination of uh, 3, 2, 1. Always add them up. And, and when you got two equivalents, you, you like I say, with one and five, with 15, it's six. If it's just one number, let's say three, two, and one, and you're getting six, then I want to break into the equivalent. What makes six and two numbers? Three and three. Three and six are both multiples of each other, whether it's three times two is six or six in itself. I can take the six and the three, and I can come up with nine. Nine takes on a whole nother significance, and I reverse it. It's still the six. Do you understand? I'm just throwing some basic numerology. Now, I'm not an expert on numerology. I do fucks with it, when I, when I, especially when I do readings, uh, because most of the deities and most of the systems that I use, there is a numerology aspect to it when I do your reading. Uh, one of my last clients a couple of days ago, and as a matter of fact, it was Taja. I don't think he's in here, uh, but he kept getting the number eight. Everything was sequenced to eight, except for, I think, his last two. Uh, one or two, but we knew what it meant. So yes, long story short, the answer to your question, most definitely, when there's a repetitiveness in that, the subconscious is making something where it's unlocking something within your psyche that you need to know. All right. Uh, good starting books with the Kuesa. The, the one I just put up there, Visions of the Night Side, the Kapothic Realm, uh, Michael W. Ford's uh, book on the Goetia is a good book. Um, there's so many books out there. Bal Cadman's got one on it, the 72 uh, 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 Demonic Angels or something like that. He's got a book on it, too. He's another one. I mean, you can just go on to Amazon and, and Google. Uh, Scribe's got a bunch of free documents on there you could pull up. There's so many good books on the Kapothic Tree by so many different authors. Uh, but those would probably be some of the few that come to my mind. Okay, you got uh, only has a really dantos veve on the one, but that means something. Yep. Damien, Damien, yeah, confirming my answer earlier about the names of the Goetia. Uh, 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't the, the spelling. Uh, if yeah, if Danim Jadet, the ram headed god of Mendez or the go to Mendez. Uh, don't work with it too much, but there is that that uh, we know with the go to Mendez, it's ties into another form or connection to that Baphomet uh, Lucifer energy. So I do know some people that work. If that's what we're talking about, the ram headed go to Mendez. I do know some people that literally work with that as a form of an archetype. I per se don't, so I don't really deal with it too much. Uh, yeah, so I guess the spelling threw me off a little bit. Uh, yes, I'm familiar with the goat of Mendez. I just the name just didn't ring a bell at the time. All right, so what else we got? Oh, damn. Yeah, the old Disney cartoon, the gargoyles. Yep. yep. Uh, Alicia Molina. I'm gonna take a few more questions. I did. I ran over my time. The first time I, I worked with Bilal, he opened the doors for Lucifer, and that's how I started the connection with uh, Lucifer. Strong and uncontrolled company. Even working with Lilith, his presence is there. True indeed. And uh, you'll find in that uh, book, Fur Set the Fury of Egypt. Uh, that's a great book to, to connect with that type of energy. Excellent book. Yeah, Lou, 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 Lou gets all the ladies. Uh, the meetup in New York is Saturday, August 17th. We're going to be meeting at Penn Station right there on 34th and 7th. Uh, and we're looking to do this meetup in the early evening hours around, you know, late dinner time ish. Want to get together with the group. Uh, we're up to about, I think, 10 or 12 people right now. We we'll want to grab some grub. And then we're just going to have a build session. If you guys got any questions, we can have a group discussion. I want to, uh, you know, see and meet some of you, see where you guys are at in this path. The eyes are the tunnel vision to the soul. So I just want to look at some people in the eyes. That gives me a good idea of where they're at, not to be judgmental, because that's not why I do it. I can usually just look through the the, the eyes and that gives me a, a I want to get a feel for everybody. And then I would like uh, interested for you to not just with me share with everybody your experiences and be good for all of us to kind of interact with each other. So I'm looking forward to it. All right. No, no problem, Mitchell. Appreciate uh, watching the channel and the support. Yes, uh, Seven Faces of Darkness by Don Webb. I know that came up last week. That's dealing with set Typhonian magic. That's that's his aspect, and that's the Greek term. That's his aspect of the, the god of chaos and storms. That is a very powerful path, too. Good book. Yeah, wild child tarot. It's, yeah, if he's a young child, just don't do anything intense in front of him. He's not going to understand. That's all. Don't like, uh, you know, do mantras and go into a frenzy. Because um, some of the work I do, I wouldn't let my son see it till he got older. I'll let him choose his path. My older son, is, I mean, he's 26. He, he's involved. So he's been involved since birth. Uh, I let my young child be a child. It's important to let them be kids. He plays sports, uh, interacts with his friends. He's got to don't take that from him. You know, I don't do like the conscious people do force the shit on them. You know, let them be kids. Uh, Matthew, what is a good goetic demon to start with? Never got into it. I, look, I, I like to start with the source. I like to start with Lucifer himself. I like to start with the source. I like to start with the rule because that's the foundation. Because overall, whether you're dealing with the Klopathic tree or the, or the Goetia, I, I start with the source. To me, in my opinion, you got to remember, if you're dealing with some of the other ones like uh, Bilal, Pemao, some of the ones we mentioned tonight, uh, they're not to diminish their purpose, but they're lesser functions. Remember, they all are an, an emanation from, from the foundation. Okay, so Tish is verifying, yeah. Okay, in the reading, the second to last one wasn't the eight. Yeah, he had eight, he had crazy eights. Crazy eights in his last uh, session. It was crazy. Eight, no matter what we did, was a manifestation eight. We couldn't stop. Yeah, it was crazy. But that's how it is sometimes. It's trying to unlock something, most definitely. All right, what else we got here? All right, let me try to get through the rest of these. I don't know if I can get through all these people. Uh, yes, you can, Mitchell. Uh, work with the Goetia, the Necronomicon, the 50 names of Marduk. Uh, yes, because they're similar energies. I know people that have combined uh, 
aspects of whether you're working with Mar, you know, the 50 names of Marduk, Tiamat, and Lille, Ninersag, Ninga, whatever. Uh, you can, because remember, you're the magician, you're the facilitator, you're in control. So you most definitely can if that's what you choose. And again, your approach, your intent, and your knowledge and education on the sit, that's the key. Yeah, that's good. Wow, Child Terror. He, he's got a lot of good books, Michael W. Ford, so I would definitely put my head in it. Oh, Duma, yeah, you're in D.C. If you can come up that Saturday, man, that'd be cool, man. Come through. You could tell, I'm sure you can take a bus right to Penn. Or you might have to come into Grand Central Station. I'm sorry, you'd have to take a train to Penn Station. You'd have to go to Grand Central Station up on 40 Deuce. Um, but I'm sure you could take, uh, I know there's a train that go from, gotta be a train that go uh, Amtrak or something from DC to Penn. If you can come through, brother, come through. Uh, if you're asking me, Mitchell, I'm, a, I'm originally, uh, I lived in two places. I'm born and raised in New York. I was born in Nassau County. Uh, grew up until high school, uh, living in Nassau County in the uh, Malvern, uh, Limburg, Lakeview, West Hempstead, Hempstead area. Uh, after I graduated high school though, I moved to the city because I worked in the city and then spent the rest of my life till I moved here. Uh, lived in Springfield Gardens in Queens, Farmers. Farmers in 167, Rochdale Village. Um, uh, so that's where I'm born and raised. Uh, left there a few years back. Yeah, Oni's over there by the Barclay. She's over there, Fulton, Atlanta. She's downtown, BK. Yeah, I know you in Buffalo, Mitch. I know it's a little bit of a ride from Manhattan, but hey, if you're able to get down there. White Castle. Yeah, you know I got to hit the White Castle when I get there. All right, what else we got? Uh, I don't know if I'm saying your name right, uh, Cisrus or yeah. In this book here has all of the Egyptian sigils. Look, I'm glad you asked that. That's a good thing about this book. All right, so Toweret is Toweret sigil. It's got all of them. I'm just gonna flip through them. Uh, that's Sopdet, the Egyptian deity Sopdet sigil. Uh, there's Tahuti, right? It's got magic and work. That's why I got this book because that's the type of work I do with the with the Egyptians. So if you're looking for a book with the ancient Egyptian sigils to work black magic, there you go. That's the book you want. Uh, only wild child two five. Okay, I guess that was a different message for. Uh, okay. Yeah, I heard about that blackout, uh, Oni. Frog God the Jester. No, I am not Puerto Rican. I am uh, Lebanese, Sicilian, and Little Peruvian. That is the uh, background. I always get confused. I can be confused for Puerto Rican, Mexican, white, uh, Arab. In Georgia, I was confused for Arab uh, in a very hateful way. Uh, that was a funny, funny thing. That was back in 2000. Uh, I was in a very ignorant part of uh, Georgia where people are not the most intelligent. Uh, but no, that's my that's my background. OK. All right. What else? OK. I think we are at the bottom now. All right, people, I kind of overstayed my time. Um, OK, yeah, I mean, it's eight hours. Wow, that's a ride. Yeah, they saw me walking with Oni. They got nervous. <laughs> yeah, so it depends on where you're at. I mean, I've been confused for for, for all of those things. Uh, I heard of that, uh, Damien, Damien. Uh, I haven't been able to watch it yet, um, but you just reminded me. All right, I'm going to check that out on Netflix. All right, people, I'm done. Uh, we'll be back on Thursday. I appreciate everybody tuning in. I appreciate the support. Um, I appreciate everybody that uh, contacts me, uh, uh, attends the events, the rituals, the consultations, the readings, and all that good stuff. Uh, oh, one last thing. We will be doing a drumming. Uh, 
I'm waiting for one of my fellow brothers, Michael Drums, with me. Uh, that shall probably be coming up in a couple of weeks. I'll, I'll have to date and put that out. All right, I appreciate everybody. We'll see everybody on Thursday night. You guys enjoy the rest of your night. Peace.